<laughs> All right, I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm Lee Quickland. I work at uh, the Rubicon Project uh, here in town. Um, we're an ad tech company. Um, I swear we're one of the good guys. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we're like the best house in a bad neighborhood. But like, <laughs> yeah. There's less crap. Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll go with that. It's just hair on. Um, I've lived in Bozeman like, I don't know, 14 years. Been lucky to be here for an awfully long time. I was one of the Right Now people, then Oracle people, and then a couple years back went over and, and did the Rubicon thing, and uh, we have an office in town. If you're interested, maybe we could find a job for you. I can't promise anything. Um, <laughs> hey, what's a program? When you write software, what is that? I didn't intend it to be rhetorical. I was hoping for like, you know, hot mess or something. Um, no, I, hopefully what you're writing is an algorithm. Like hopefully it's this deterministic thing uh, where we follow some steps and it, it does some stuff, right? Um, when I went to college, uh, they taught us an analogy for an algorithm. I don't know if you were taught that, but I was taught like a recipe is a typical way to think of an algorithm. Um, and so when you follow recipes, uh, what's a common mistake you make? See, okay, that's not mine, but that's because I don't bake. I, I'm smart enough not to bake because baking is hard. Um, anybody else? Didn't follow the recipe. Didn't follow the recipe? Okay, so um, I'm not going to make comments about Mike's ability to follow directions. Um, my mistake is that I will forget to check that I have everything before I start. So I'm like, I want some delicious pesto, I'm like dreaming of basil and garlic, because really those are the only things I really want in life. Um, and some pine nuts go in, in the, the mix as well. So, you know, I go to the pantry and I grab those things, put them in the food processor, and, and I get done. I'm like, this doesn't taste right. It's because I forgot to check, do I have any pecorino? Because what's pesto without pecorino besides a sad, sludgy green goo? <laughs> Patrick pointed out earlier that it's vegan, which I think is actually kind of a synonym for sad, sludgy green goo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, right? So. I go to make a recipe, I forget to check that I have everything, and it kind of turns out poorly. Um, so, you know, if I'm following a recipe, I should fo take all of the ingredients, follow the steps, unlike Mike, and uh, end up with a happy, yummy thing. And if I've got code, like I should take some input, follow the steps of the code, end up with a happy output. Well, what is the input to our applications? Data. Data! Woo! Well, can we be slightly more specific, Mr. Turner? Unstructured data. Oh, MongoDB, I love you so much. Um, anybody else? Configuration. Configuration. Oh, see, Colt like actually read the title of my talk. <laughs> so good. Anybody else? Um, maybe user input. You know, like some of us have those things. It's not. It can't all just be like giant batch operations. Um, but you know, we've also got configuration. So uh, I think our industry has gotten better at sanitizing the input that comes from user input uh, and, and comes from our data stores. I mean, maybe not MongoDB, maybe not like classic PHP, where like little Bobby Tables rules the world and ends all your databases. But you know, like we're, we're getting better, but not so much in configuration land. Uh, and it's not just me saying this. I found this happy paper that was presented last year where these folks went and looked at a bunch of open source projects and said, no, we're not doing a terribly good job as an industry of validating our configuration before we run. Uh, so uh, configuration errors have become one of the major causes of failures in large-scale cloud and internet systems they found. I thought that was nice. And then they listed off a bunch of examples of where our favorite cloud providers have gone for, down for hours or days over the last decade because they didn't bother to have something in place that would validate that the configuration was good um, when people made changes. So looking at one of those in depth, uh, in 2010, App Engine went down for a few hours. Uh, and here's kind of the sequence of events. The power went down in the data center. Um, backup power, for whatever reason, didn't make it to all of the boxes. So the services in that um, data center didn't work out correctly because some of the boxes went away because they didn't have power. So then ops uh, changed the configuration as the runbook told them to, to fail over to other places. Ah, but wait, our configuration was busted. So the out, uh, outage persisted longer because ops didn't know how to determine what the right configuration was or how to you know, go forward from there. Um, in my own personal life uh, or professional life uh, at Rubicon, we've got this piece of software 
that uh, uh, manages data retention and mirroring. So it uh, copies data between data centers and, and decides after how long that data should be purged from the system. So we needed a change to the retention time for one of those directories. Uh, pull request went out, it got reviewed, it got merged. Um, of course, there was a syntax error in the configuration file. Nobody noticed, because it's in this like batch job that runs later. And uh, <laughs> then the reporting stopped. Uh, and because it's on a weekend and I'm on vacation, you know, I'm particularly sad when we find out that the reporting pipeline that I work on isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. So uh, the authors of this paper say, since it is so hard to completely avoid configuration errors, after all, all of us make mistakes, even system administrators, uh, a more practical approach is to detect er errors as early as possible in order to minimize their failure damage. So why isn't it enough just to start up the applications to determine if the configuration is good? Because we have to do a call and we're going to take a, a signal. Yeah, roughly. Um, or so defaults are bad. I mean, even having defaults isn't going to solve it, right? Like, if you're in um, some sort of distributed system, you can't just have default values for where all of your systems are located, probably. Um, so the example they give is uh, Squid, which is a web proxy, was reconfigured to change log rotation. And Squid doesn't validate that configuration on startup. Uh, so days later, when Squid was ready to roll that log file over, uh, the error was exposed. And the failure behavior in Squid was to just sit in a loop and keep retrying, which soaked up all the CPU on the box and basically took the site down, uh, which then baffled the poor system administrator because it looks to him like his system's under incredible load because his web proxy that does the caching up front is just obliterated by CPU. So it, take, it took him a few days to figure out what was wrong. So the authors of this paper call that a latent configuration error. And it's what I'm going to call the time bomb in your configuration. So, uh, like I said, they went through a bunch of open source projects. They identified a bunch of the configuration things there. And then they looked to see which of those had uh, validation up front. Um, and the answer is uh, most of them don't have validation up front. And then of those that don't have validation up front, they went to figure out which ones didn't get used in the initialization phase. And basically, those are the ones that have the potential for latent configuration errors. And across these <laughs> things that I depend on, like HDFS and YARN, uh, the possibility of a latent configuration error is really high. So that's delightful. Um, and they say latent configuration errors uh, contribute to 75% of the high severity issues and take much longer to diagnose, indicating their high impact and damage, just like that uh, squid error that we saw. Okay, so what would we do in an ideal world? We'd probably validate our configuration on startup. More than just saying like, I have a value for config foo, I have a value for config foo that makes some amount of sense. And then I would uh, maybe even validate outside of my application because maybe my application is expensive to start up or I have to run it in a special environment. So uh, the authors of this paper uh, offered a proprietary piece of software. They didn't publish it. Um, you know, and they, like good academics everywhere, they uh, uh, hid their data and, and moved on. Uh, I'm going to show you some open source tools that I think help uh, you do these sorts of things. Um, I only have time to show you one language, and since I like Scala, I'm going to show you Scala. Um, that's that. So this is real code that I'm going to show you. If you want, you can go to this uh, URL and see the sample project that I made sure all this compiled and worked in. Um, but I promise it's real code. Uh, fake news, but real code. That'd be great. Um, so let's have our motivating example here be that we need to construct an awesome client. Let's, you know, this is just sort of a uh, mock of something that talks to a thing on the internet and uh, has an API key that needs to send it. And we uh, are smart enough to have timeouts because like we're not just gonna make synchronous rest calls without timeouts, are we? Come on guys. Uh, and a place to read from on the internet and a path locally to write to. That path is a local file path. So uh, let's, let's uh, write a config file to make this configurable. All right, here we go. Um, let's have a config file that looks roughly like this. We've got our super secret key that we put in our API key. Uh, we're gonna just you know, uh, mindlessly use 15,000 as our timeout. Everybody will just assume that's probably seconds or milliseconds or something. Who knows, right? It, it doesn't matter much. Um, and uh, we'll read from a particular URL and it'll write somewhere else. Okay. 
And then over my career, I've seen a lot of code that does stuff like this, and it looks roughly like this, where we uh, load up a properties file, um, we tell the properties file to give us each of the things, we inline, convert each of the strings that we get out of the property file to the right data type. Um, you know, this, this, I think, is probably a fair representation of a lot of code that people write. Uh, do you, I mean, am I? No, you were asked. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel it's, sad it's about eerie. Oh, good, good. All right, so, so uh, what about this eerie piece of software is uh, not so good? What can we do better? How do you handle failure? Oh, man, failure. Yeah. yeah, what if it doesn't cast to one of those types that you're trying? Oh, boy, it's going to be delightful. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so we have that. We'll get to that. Uh, another thing I hate about that is we've mixed all the logic of our business logic with our configuration logic, right? So I've worked on code bases where the methods are hundreds or thousands of lines long, and uh, like 80% of some of those blocks will be grabbing a value out of a configuration, ensuring that it's cool, converting it to some other type, and then getting a value, and finally doing something with that other 20%. You're just like, oh god, I can't tell what's happening here. Um, so I would much rather we separate the configuration from that. Um, the types are just sort of a hurdle, right? I mean, it, it, <laughs> if you're living in an untyped land and you've got your awesome client, it just takes you know four parameters. It doesn't specify what the types are of them. And uh, sure, that's a whole lot easier for me because I just funnel through these strings and like hope for the best on the other side, right? Um, the data types are in my way. It's not like a, an escalator that's lifting me up. It's a thing I'm having to jump over. Um, and there tends to be a lot of repetition here. Like I'm, I'm repeatedly getting the strings out, and if I had like two longs in a row, I would have done the two long over and over again. Um, all right, uh, another problem is the configuration errors are reported late and badly. And by that, I mean, um, as our friend pointed out back there, uh, if I can't read a valid URL out of read from, I'm gonna get an exception that like tells me the call stack, sure, of where it happened, but like I don't know what line in the configuration was busted, and that's probably the information I want if I have to fix this. And I don't get the error when I start the application, I get it when I try to make my awesome client go do things. Um, so that, that's not super cool. Um, and I can't verify anything without running that app, right? If, uh, if in the environments I have worked in, uh, developers don't usually own the configuration, it's the ops side of the house that does. And so if I can give them an easy way to check if the configuration's good, they're much more likely to do it. If the answer is like, oh, modify the config and then go run the app, yeah, that maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, right? Um, maybe it'll be like that mo <laughs> mirroring and uh, data replication and, and retention app where it didn't get run and nobody knew that it was busted for days. That'd be fun. Um, so uh, let's try and do better. So we'll do better by making a class that we'll write our uh, configuration data into first. Okay, so this is my class. <laughs> it looks eerily like the uh, API of my awesome client. And uh, then again, I could have a block of code that does roughly the same thing as before, except instead of sticking the data directly into the awesome client, I'll stick it into my vanilla configuration here. Um, and then I would later push that into the awesome client. Well. What's, what's bad about this? What can we do better still? Well, I'd say we're having to still duplicate the names in the configuration file, and then again in the code that pulls values out of the properties object, and then they're the same as the, the, the uh, config object that we're pushing it into. And we're having to translate the kebab case to camel case, that sort of thing. Uh, we're still having to write a lot of explicit conversions from string to field type, and uh, we're still reporting badly. We're not explaining what line of config file things are on. So uh, there's a library for Scala called Peer Config uh, that I like a bunch. I sent a couple PRs against it to make it better. Um, it magically maps the field names to config names. It uses the data type of that config object to do the translation from string to the data you actually have. And then it builds on top of another library called TypeSafe Config that gives you a nicer config language. Um, pop quiz, how do you write a comment in JSON? 
you pick something you're not using. Right, you have a field called comment, and you, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's delightful. So that means that uh, at runtime, you get to load your comments into memory as well. It's awesome. Um, so uh, this format gives you, uh, you know, kind of the best of JSON and properties files where you can have comments and nested data and, you know, nice, nice things. Um, and it merges together um, multiple files as well as environment variables or uh, command line properties. Um, and that's all configurable stuff. So uh, let's let's play a little bit here with type safe config. Um, I'm going to change my config file up slightly. So this is now a, a Hokan format up top. I'm kind of you know pretending it's JSONy. I can use sort of any mixture of syntax between property file and JSON file I want there. Um, and my timeout it says 15 seconds. Um, so you know now I've got some units. That's cool. And uh, down here in my config, I'm going to use a finite duration instead of longs. Finite duration is just a data type in Scala that knows the units and the scalar part of the time. So that's handy. Uh, and then to load that, I write this line of code. Pure config, load config, or throw, shiny config. And it gives me a shiny config, or as the name suggests, throws an exception. And you know, to make cold happy, we can choose not to make it throw an exception. We can have it give us a left or a right. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not gonna burden you guys with disjunctive types today. So uh, I did lie to you a little bit. Uh, earlier I suggested it was magic. It's not magic. It's uh, verified at compile time, well-documented, configurable, and extensible. I say it's verified at compile time in the sense that if you go to do this stuff in, um, let's say, Java, uh, maybe what you'd do is you'd write a, a thing that deserialized some XML into a particular class. And if you didn't have a mapping for that XML to a particular type in your target, uh, you're gonna get a runtime exception. Well, that seems dumb, like why would I want that? I want the compiler to tell me ahead of time, I don't know how to do this, and give me a nice error so I can figure things out there. Um, I say it's well documented, a bunch of the PRs I've sent have uh, been to make the documentation better, because um, you know, I, I'm, I can write the words. Um, and this here's the table of contents, which uh, you know, I'm, I'm particularly proud that I would manage to slide the word whence into the table of contents, because <laughs> And nobody knows what that means, uh, but they took it. Uh, it's configurable. There are lots of different ways to load the configuration. Like I said, you can use the property files or the environment and so forth. Um, and there are lots of different ways to make it map config fields to the keys. So uh, if you don't like the kebab case in your config files, you can just have camel case in both cases, and that's simple enough to do. And it's extensible. So uh, I need support for Hadoop's path for a lot of the work that I do. Uh, pure config doesn't include that out of the box because who wants Hadoop as a dependency, am I right? Um, so out of the box, if I add a Hadoop path to my config object and then tell pure config, load config or throw, the compiler says, nope, I don't know how to do that. I mean, it does it kind of poorly, but it tells me I don't know how to do that, uh, which I like because then I know I need to go write some more software. So then I go add a line of code like this and the real meat of it is this third line. I'm trying to create a path from the string that was in the configuration, and then I catch any exceptions in a try. Uh, and now uh, my config library has uh, been extended to support a new type. Um, pure config supports defaults, so uh, as he suggested, maybe I can have a default timeout of 30 seconds instead of having to put it in my file every time, or I can write my data to dev null by default for optimal performance speed. <laughs> it's web scale, I hear. Um, so, what can we do even better than my shiny config? Well, um, I know that API key shouldn't be an empty string, right? Like, if, if I have an empty string, the service is almost certainly going to reject me. Um, like every problem, no. Um, and uh, timeout should be positive, because if I have a negative timeout, like, well, I should just give up as soon as I start it. Um, so there's another library called Refined, which allows you to have uh, type refinements. That is to say that I can use the standard types built in and then um, annotate that with some additional information that become runtime checks that ensure that every time I construct a value of that type, the value coming in um, conforms to that. So I'll get to some examples of that. Um, so I could write, like on these top two lines here, I could say my API key is now a string that's refined to be non-empty. And my duration is now refined to be positive. And uh, I write my pure config load config or throw, and it uh, reads the values out of the config, and then as it's constructing a refined config, ensures 
that the string is not empty, etc. So, you know, that, that's pretty cool. You can do even crazier stuff with refined. Um, TCP ports, uh, they're in the range of 0 to 2 to the 16th minus 1, right? But the first 1,024 are only usable by root. So most of the time, you're not going to run your services as root, am I right? <laughs> so you don't want to let your port, uh, your configuration specify a port that's like in the root range, because that's obviously going to fail as soon as you try. So this particular thing means um, make an integer range where the value must be between 1024 and 2 to the 16th minus 1. Or I could write this, which would let me say, not only does my API key have to be non-empty, but very specifically, it must match the regex of having either letters or numbers and being exactly 36 characters long. And so at runtime, I go to shove a value into my API key type, and it you know, runs this regex on it to make sure it's cool. I can get crazier. I could write uh, an open port type, or an available port type, which anytime it tries to construct that, tries to open up the port and ensure that I have the right to do that. Um, that's what that mess of stuff is doing. We can do other stuff. We could uh, have a writable directory type that made sure that the path that I specified is a directory and I have permission to write it. Now, I, I'm not sure how wise these last couple tricks are um, because now I can't really test my configuration in any environment. I have to do it in my target environment and I have to run it as the user that I want it to be as, so maybe Maybe I've lost something there. Um, maybe now that I'm starting to side effect, I've, I've um, have the potential for causing other problems. I'm not sure. Like I haven't worked out what's the best there. But hey, you can do a lot of neat stuff with refined. Um, so then finally, we get to that other thing I said we should have, which is a way to uh, check our config ahead of time. Right? We've we've built um, a library that knows how to validate our configuration, and then we can shove a line of code into a main that loads our config and prints it out. And then we can give you know, the ops people or whomever a line of code like this that says, run that thing, and it'll do that. And if the configuration's bad, they'll get a nice error message that explains why. Well, I mean, they'll probably get a stack trace or something, because we said to throw instead of to, to do a disjunctive type like Colt wanted. But um, you know, we, we could have done nicer, but this fits on a slide better than Colt's idea. <laughs> So where are we at? Uh, we're verifying our config at startup. We're verifying more than just we have values, but we're also verifying that they're good. And we have given ourselves a utility so that we can verify things ahead of time outside of our application. Um, I think that's pretty neat. Uh, what don't we have? Well, if you don't have Scala, um, there's no magic here. We said that already, right? Uh, we just have a whole bunch of boilerplate reduction. So um, you could build this stuff. Like There maybe have been people that have gone off and built this in the languages that you like to use. Um, that refined library I mentioned was like stolen from Haskell, so Haskell probably has cool stuff like this. So, you know, I hope lots of you are using nice tools like Haskell and Scala. So yeah, it's how many people are using Haskell? And yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, do you guys have any questions for me? 